where uh, there were just healthy people coming in to do the same kind of experiment, with, but without the training and without all this motivation. And we saw a, a huge effect in the, the, uh, the healthy partner and their patients, about five times bigger than we saw in ordinary people coming in. But or, even ordinary healthy people still among couples, one person directing their intense thoughts towards another will cause a physiological change. This doesn't say that, that the person who's receiving the thoughts is healed. It doesn't say that they're getting a healing response, but it definitely shows that if one person is thinking about you, uh, and, and typically that you, you know each other, that your body does respond. So this, uh, so, so the, the case did, here did, is, uh, Excuse me, Dean. Did the recipient describe the, the feeling, uh, in other words, you said there was a, a big effect. Um, in what way did the recipient describe that effect? Well, most of the time, remember that the, the protocol is such that at random times, the, the sending party is told to send, and the receiver right. party has no idea when this is taking place, and they right. don't know how long the sending periods are, so they can't be biased by any of that. Uh, what they sometimes re- respond, though, is that they, they feel that their heartbeat, heartbeat is beginning to increase, or they feel a flush in their face or a flush in their extremities. Gotcha. On two occasions, not in this experiment, but a previous experiment similar to this. We had couples come in, a man and a woman, who had, had just met each other. And they went through the experiment. And afterwards, I always debrief the, the participants to see how it was for them. Uh, and and these, for these two couples, they were, they were kind of standoffish. They were sort of hemming and hawing about what it was like. Later, I learned that, uh, in, in this case, they were both the woman was the receiver, the man was the sender. And uh, for both of these couples, the man was feeling just overwhelming waves of love for this woman that he had just met. And she felt it. She felt waves. Both of them described waves of of love just saturating them. And both couples ended up getting married as a result. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, I've got a good friend. I I won't mention who it is, so I I don't embarrass her. But... um, we're both cat lovers, and um, I, I've got three cats that have trailed me around the world a couple times now. And um, she told me that she was taught that she could communicate with her cats by, this sounds kind of crazy, but you, you, you know a cartoon uh, where somebody's saying something in a cartoon, and there's a little, there's a little bubble uh, above their head, and it describes what they're saying or thinking or whatever. And the way you communicate with a cat is to mentally close your eyes and create this little bubble with what you want to communicate to a cat. And then you send this little bubble, like, I love you, or get up and come here, or something like that. And I've tried it a number of times, and I'm telling you, it works. Uh, it gets their attention. Suddenly their head will snap up and it's like they heard something or they, they just felt something. I can't, I can't tell you which, but that's – you might try that at home, folks. Just make a little cartoon bubble with what you want to say and project it toward your dog or your cat. And, and you will see a response. It's the damnedest thing. So maybe it's kind of the same thing. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds – it's very similar. There's, there's no reason to believe that this is only something that works between humans. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would. I'd expect that there would be some animals who would be talented in their own way, uh, and 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 be receptive to these things. Sure. Okay. Um, I have to touch on this. Uh, I didn't know you had done this, but apparently, you've done some experiments on the survival of the spirit after the death of the body. Is that correct? Well, we haven't done it yet, but I. Uh. I, I work with people who have been doing research on mediumship, mental mediumship, mm-hmm. uh, double and triple blind and even quadruple blind studies uh, to get rid of any possible bias on the part of the mediums, on the part of the experimenters or the sitters. And these are very impressive experiments that, that at least show that mediums, some mediums, are very good at getting information apparently from departed loved ones. Now, there's still a question 
there's been a question for a century within parapsychology as to where does the information actually come from? Right. Is it telepathy from the sitter, or is it actually from a departed person? And so these, the line of experimentation now, and there are not very many people doing this, but this particular set of experiments, it's a, a place called the Winbridge Institute, they're very clever in trying to piece apart where the information is coming from for a medium. And if it turns out that uh, as we get closer and closer to answering that question, we'll finally, I think, be able to start answering this, this age-old question of uh, when you die, what happens? And so that's, this is something I have not been previously in, involved in, but I, I plan to, to do so because it's really a fascinating area. Well, it's the biggest question in human existence, of course. Mm-hmm. What happens after we die? So that's coming up, I guess. You're, you're, as a matter of fact, speaking of coming up, you're writing uh, a new book? I am, yes. A couple of years uh. ago, I, I was a co-host for a small invitational meeting about 60 people, all of whom were identified as being thought leaders in, acad- in, in academia, mostly psychology, but also some neuroscience, physics, and a few other areas, a couple of Nobel laureates, uh, some members of the National Academy of Sciences. We had to promise to everybody we would never say who they were, because otherwise they wouldn't have shown up at our conference, and we were discussing the state of the art of sci research. We actually had to hold the conference outside of the United States even, because this topic is so sensitive among academics. But everyone we asked, all these prominent people, they all immediately said, yeah, I'll go, because we told them who the other people were, and they knew it was a a real thing. So I'm now in the process of writing a book which will document uh, the the talks and what happened at that meeting. And it'll it'll be published by an academic press, and it's, it's, it's intended to document, among other things, that when academics are exposed to the data, and they actually sit down for two days, this was a two-day meeting, and exposed to one speaker after the other talking about the technical details of this, that their opinion about the nature of the evidence improves significantly. Because what we asked them after each talk was, well, what do you think of the evidence so far after each talk? And it significantly increased. All right, and your book, The Conscious Universe, now out in paperback, I would presume, pretty much across the country, or it's, what's the deal? It's, uh, I believe it's released on June 30th, but of course it could be pre-ordered anywhere. And it's, uh, it's the same book as the, the hardback, but now it's half the price. <laughs> All right. And of course, um, Entangled Mind is still available as well. Okay. Um, and finally, what experiments are you working on right now? There's something about light, right? Right. I'm doing mind-matter interaction experiments where it's not really matter, but light. It's mind-light experiments, two types. One type is taking advantage of the simplest way of demonstrating a quantum effect, which uses an optical double slit system. So you send a beam of light through two tiny slits. It creates an interference pattern. And we know that if you gain knowledge, if you observe the system, that it will so-called collapse the wave function, and the interference pattern goes away. So I'm using that kind of a setup, only instead of using a detector like your eye to look at the double slit, I'm asking people to use their imagination, to use their mind's eye at a distance to look inside the sealed box, which has the, the optical apparatus, and see whether the mind's eye can gain information from this quantum system and, as a result, cause it to collapse. Essentially what this is is a clairvoyance detector, a, in, a, in a sense, or a remote viewing detector. That Yeah, I guess it is. We're asking people to use their non-local aspects of their consciousness to dive into, into an optical double slit system and see whether that affects the, the light. And I've done 100 sessions so far with this experiment, and the answer so far is it appears that it does. That <laughs> the act of putting your mind... Uh, in the vicinity of a, of a double slit and trying to gain information about the photons going through the slit makes a measurable difference in terms of what's happening. All right. We've got to turn to the phones. I promised Brad in Syracuse, New York. You're on the air with Dean Radin. Hi. Hi, hi, hi Dean. Hi, Brad. Hi, how you doing? Uh, by the way, I've got the Sea Crane's Calamity Kit, and our family loves it. It's a, it's a great tool to have during a calamity. 
but uh, my, my